We are here for Habits of Humility, Congregational Teams as Learning Communities. My name is Pat Infanti. I am part of the Congregational Life staff. Uh, I work for the Central East Region. I'm the Reverend Renee Rohutsky. I am a Congregational Life Consultant also in the Central East Region with Pat. Hi everybody, my name is Lori Stone Sertoski and I'm coming here today from Indianapolis, Indiana, which is in the Mid-America region. And I represent an emerging uh, covenanting community you might have heard of uh, it this morning in general session, Sacred Path. I'm a lay leader with that community. I've been a Unitarian Universalist for over 20 years. And technology being what it is, Renee and I have been working with Lori for months and we have just met for the first time. So we, we feel like we know her from those many Skype meetings. So I'm going to let Renee start us off. So I was an engineer in my first career, so I use a lot of engineering terms. Um, so the first one is I'm going to offer you some framing of what, we're, what we mean when we talk about humility. So there's a, a term that's floating around uh, systems thinking and organizational development called keystone habits. And so we see that this uh, creating a habit of humility is one of these keystone habits. And so a keystone is that, that horse stone up there. It's the stone that allows the arch to hold together. It's the last stone you drop in and then everything stays in place. And the idea of a keystone habit, it's one change that unlocks a series of changes in gifts. So for example, um, a keystone habit that I've tried to create for myself in my personal life is to don't get behind the wheel of the car, if possible. And so what that's done, it's helped me to understand how to negotiate mass transit systems. So coming to a place like Portland, it's a lot easier to do once I've done it in other places. Uh, it encourages me to get you know, more exercise by walking to the store or bicycling to the store. I spend less money because I can't get to the mall. The mall's not that close. I have to drive to get there. So that one habit of avoiding getting behind the wheel of my car has unlocked a bunch of other habits. So that's the idea of the keystone habit. And so um, when we talk about a culture of humility, it's a culture where no one is the expert. So, you know, Unitarian Universalists are known for being whip-smart people, right? And it's in a lot of us um, also come out of the academic community. And so there's often some cultural stuff that bleeds over from some of these other communities, or, or maybe even the business community. But we are a covenanted, covenantal religion. And so um, part of our learning for today is how is humility a key aspect of being in covenant with one another? And how will that help our communities um, become learning communities? So uh, I think of the opposite of humility, the, the things that um, keep us from being humble with one another, is being kind of viruses in our systems, viruses in our congregations. So here's a lovely, um, but the idea is um, with viruses, you want to be able to create Im immunities. Viruses are always free floating in our systems, but until they land someplace, that's when they start causing trouble. So I want to offer three um, viruses that show up in our congregations. The first one I'm going to call scoring. These are three S's, so it's easy to remember. Scoring, sneering, and shaming. So these are, and I'm going to explain these a little bit, but these are the viruses that we want to help you create immunities against. We'll start out with scoring. And scoring is simply where someone is trying to be the smartest person in the room. Oh, I read a book on that. Oh, I know all about meditation. I went to a workshop on that in General Assembly. It's this, this temptation to think that we know everything. And one place where this, um, this shows up in academia, right? You, you want to be the one who has the best research and also discredits other people's research, perhaps. And so sometimes we come to church and we try to discredit other people's ideas. Um, so this is so this is this is what I mean by scoring. The second one is sneering, and this is the habit of making sarcastic comments about others who don't get it the way we get it. So this time, this sometimes shows up in our justice work. You know, we're the smart liberals who get every you know get all these issues, climate change. We sneer at those people who are climate change deniers. 
We sneer at people who maybe um, are doing cultural misappropriation stuff because we get what cultural misappropriation is. So if somebody uses a song inappropriately, we might sneer about that. And finally, shaming, and that's directly calling out people who don't get it. Um, and, and sadly, this shows up. I've seen this happen. You've probably seen this happen, too. Of, um, and this isn't covenantal. There's a, there's a way of calling someone into covenant when they, when they make a mistake. And I've had that happen to me. Um, one of my favorite examples is I was in a workshop, and I used the term uh, slave driver. I'm being a slave driver moving you through this, this material. Never even occurred to me that that would be a term that might be hurtful to some people. And people called me back into it and I was like, okay, yeah, I guess that's right. That's an idiom that, you know, just rolled off my tongue without any thought. So that they were calling me into covenant. But sometimes we do that in more hurtful shaming ways. And so that's the kind of shaming piece that I'm talking about. So, um, so the idea of having the keystone habit of humility is creating an, an inoculant against these viruses that show up in our con congregations. So do you, do you see these viruses, and, you know, these three? Do you see those in your congregations? Show of hands a little bit. Okay, great. And so we have a story for you. All right, so we're going to talk today about um, a problem that Pacific Power and Light here in the Pacific Northwest was having a while back. Uh, this is a utility company that serves many cust customers in the Cascade Mountains. It was facing an ongoing problem of ice building up on the power lines, serving and then jeopardizing uh, the distribution of power to their customers in that area. It was causing an undesirable and unsafe job situation for the PPNL linemen. So you, you, you understand in the Pacific Northwest, it's not always 100 degrees. <laughs> there are a number of ice storms in the fall and the summer, and these storms result in an accumulation of significant ice load on the lines. And if it's not removed periodically throughout these periods, the ice accumulates to the point where the lines break. And so the method used to remove the ice was to send the linemen up to the top on these poles. They'd have to climb in very dangerous situations and take a really long pole that they carried with them as they climbed up that has a hook on the end. And then they would just rattle the lines until the ice broke off. The linemen, as you can imagine, hated this job because it meant that they would have to go into the woods in the adverse weather conditions, and then a number of them sometimes would fall or injure themselves in the process of doing this. So PBL had in the past conducted a number of brainstorming sessions, getting people in a room, all of the experts to try to solve this problem. And unfortunately, they could never quite figure it out. So, what do you think they did? They hired a consultant. <laughs> That's right. And the consultant suggested this time around to also get into a room, but to assemble everyone, cross-functional teams from every department in the company. Uh, so they had secretaries and accountants and people from the mail room and from the kitchen and everywhere. They came together along with the engineers and the supervisors and all the linemen and, and management. And so they all got together in a big boardroom and started another brainstorming session. Well, several hours into the meeting, the consultant was beginning to become concerned because th this effort was looking like it was being about as unproductive as the other ones. There were some people being wallflowers, and there were some people taking up in a whole lot of space in the room uh, as they were uh, trying to solve this problem that's been ongoing and plaguing them. So, she... she called to attention and said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna break up into small groups and we're going to put diverse people from each of these functional units into each of these groups. And then she sent them out into find their own spaces and said, please don't come back until you have an answer, a viable solution. 
Okay, so they did that. They went into these small groups, and the first thing they started doing, once they got together back when their teams, is they started complaining about the consultant. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Why hadn't she come better prepared? We we're wasting time. Um, doesn't she understand we need answers? We hired her, we're paying good money, right? Does sound familiar? <laughs> Anybody in a congregation who's hired a consultant? Doesn't she understand how serious this problem is? So the complaining about the competency of the consultant went on and on until they started suggesting these outrageous ideas as possible solutions. They went absurdly overboard. One group who had a couple of linesmen, this one of the linesmen suggested, um, I hope we can finally figure out a better way to skin this cat, he said. I really hate this job. Why, just last week I was coming down from a pole, and when I hit the ground, I was looking eye to eye in one of the biggest black bears around. He chased me for over a mile. He did not like that I was in his territory, and I can understand why. So, Somebody suggested, why don't we just train the bears to climb the poles? Kind of sarcastically again. They're so big and heavy that their weight could probably be enough to shake the wires and knock the ice off. And so the ideas kept spinning around and around that idea. But then the laughter died down, and the group was starting to pick a hundred reasons why training bears to climb the poles would not work. <laughs> then, another linesman suggested that although training the bears seemed foolish on the surface, perhaps maybe we could entice the bears to go up the top. Maybe we could place honey pots at the top of the poles. And again, a lot of laughter, a lot of kind of picking at that idea, and a concern was raised that bears like honey in good weather and bad weather. So how would we get the bears to just climb the poles during the icy weather? And how would we keep the honeypots filled? So a particularly sarcastic linesman then offered this. You know all those fancy helicopters the fat cats in the front office fly around in all the time? Why don't we just grab one of those and fly from pole to pole, dropping the honeypots in only when the icy weather was coming? Of course, another round of laughter. <laughs> then, one of the wallflowers, one of the secretaries who hadn't spoken all day, she spoke up and said, hey, I was a nurse's aide in Vietnam. I saw many injured soldiers arriving at the field hospital by helicopter, and the downwash from the hel helicopter blades was very, very intense. It was almost blinding. I wonder if we just flew the helicopter over the lines, would the downwash knock the ice off? This time, there was no laughter. By the way, ever since the meeting that they had this way, the PP and L people use helicopters to knock the ice off of the lines. Okay. All right. Now for the audience participation. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you all to get into pairs with your shoulder partners, the person that your shoulder is next to. And for the next few minutes, we are going to reflect with our partner on these two questions. Did you hear examples of the three viruses in the bear story? We can put that slide back up maybe. And then what could the group have done differently? So as you are talking in your small groups or your part pairs, if you would like to tweet on hashtag UUHumility, we'll monitor that channel as best we can. If you have any epiphanies that you want to share out with the larger group. Okay, so let's go ahead and take some time for that. Remember, I'm just going to remind you the viruses are scoring, sneering, and shaming. So looking for examples of those, and then what could they have done differently? 
So um, I am, in addition to being a Congregational Life Consultant, I'm the Program Manager within Central East Region for Faith Development. And um, part of my work with Faith Development is, is kind of helping congregations understand what their learning goals are and how they are a learning community. So we're going to just spend a couple of minutes thinking about what the work we do, the learning work is that we do in our congregations. Because that's a por an important part of kind of figuring out what that, uh, that keystone habit might be for your congregation. So for um, spiritual strength in congregation, there's, there's some general characteristics that we see in our work as, as uh, congregational life consultants. One of those is that ongoing commitment to learning together. And that can come in many forms. That can come in, um, uh, in larger congregational events. It can come in small group ministry. It can, it, can be, uh, it can manifest in our leadership work, learning together as leaders. Has anybody um, ever done uh, the Serving with Grace book? Done any, any reading, any kind of spiritual um, reflection of a, of a book or, uh, or just a reading at the beginning of a, of a committee or a board meeting? That's one way that we, that we learn together. That's a small piece of it. But engaging in dialogue, engaging in reflection, and spending time just touching, reaching down to some of those more challenging conversations is really important to our work and to growing as a leader. Um, another piece of spiritual strength in the congregation is this willingness to be in covenant. And sometimes that covenant requires us to be vulnerable with one another to truly get to that place where, we're, where we are. Jim Key talked this morning about covenant being both a noun and a verb. And to really get to that place where covenant is what we do, that sometimes means that, uh, particularly as leaders, we need to, um, we need to be willing to, to, uh, to be vulnerable with our, with our fellow leaders. Another piece of spiritual strength in the congregation is curiosity. Uh, trusting in leaders is one way that congregations can really develop a strong core. Um, engaging with difference, developing resilience, openness to those things that are not things that were not necessarily known, and that kind of harkens back to one of the three S's, which is the, um, is it, which one is the? the the scoring, yeah, yeah. So kind of being open to things that we don't know a lot about. So all of these things are important in developing our congregation and in, in forming, doing that faith formation work in the congregation. And any one of these really can be the basis for uh, a keystone habit. Uh, every congregation is different. Some congregations have uh, have a really high commitment to learning together. Some congregations have uh, just a really uh, long and deep commitment to, to discovery, to learning together, to being curious about new things. Some congregations, and we're gonna hear a couple of stories that might be good examples of resilience. So maybe their keystone habit is resilience. So learning as a community um, really is uh, an important habit for congregations to develop. Uh, learning can help us not only, you know, sort of, first of all, learn about things that we don't know about, but also to hear how other people uh, understand new topics or understand leadership or understand the challenges or the conflicts that we're working through as a congregation. If we sit together and learn, uh, we kind of we can level the playing field a little bit. We, we don't have uh, a room with uh, one or two experts. We have a room where everybody is a learner and everyone is a teacher. Uh, and learning as a community, by the way, is an intergenerational, a multi-generational part of faith community. So, um, you know, sometimes in our congregations, we, we don't always honor the, the life experience and the perception and the lens of, of our young people, of even our children, even our youngest children, who uh, can bring that wonder and mystery and playfulness back into our work and back into our congregational life. So we can all learn from one another. All ages learn. So we want to share 
you know, a couple of success stories. You want to know, well, what are you guys talking about and how does this work in a real congregation? And so the next kind of segment of our time together is going to be focusing on three different kinds of success stories. I think Lori's first. All right, so I represent, as I mentioned, Sacred Path. We are a relatively new faith community. Uh, we just started uh, meeting together and working together three years ago. Um, this is some of the photos that kind of describe and show some of the work that we do. We have a very strong commitment to mission, and we also, um, since we were new and are still very new, uh, we also ask these questions quite a bit. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? <laughs> this is also, for those of you with the knowing laughter, one of the chants in the Singing the Journey hymn supplement, the Teal Hymnal. Uh, and there's another line in this, hymn, in this chant, though, called Mystery, Mystery, Life is a Riddle and a Mystery. And I think that the core of uh, Sacred Path success to date lies in this and how you interpret this. When I was first singing this chant with people years ago, I just kind of shrugged my shoulders. Mystery, it's a mystery, we don't know. <laughs> but through the, the path and the journey that I have had with my, my fellow uh, members of faith community and Sacred Path, I now hear this last line as an answer to the previous questions. Where do we come from? What is our source? Mystery. What are we? Mystery. What is our essence? And then where are we going? Destiny. Mystery. In order to adopt that frame of mind, we have to let it go of a lot of certainty. <laughs> we have to move in with uncertainty, get comfortable with it, make friends with it, more than make friends with it. We have to sidle up to it and just dig in with uncertainty. And so that's what we've been doing, and it has definitely caused a lot of uh, accidental development of this keystone habit of humility, let me tell you. <laughs> so, um, so in the first year that we were together, um, we had to make a lot of decisions. A lot of decisions about what, how to even be together and how to when and where and how and all of those basic things and what to do and why. And I'll tell you what, that first year was a little bit rocky. Um, but we were on the journey together. And it was, we weren't sure where we were going, but we knew that we, we would get there if we had faith. And so we had all of these elaborate um, decision-making processes where we were trying to use modified consensus and we would rank things and vote and talk about things. And, and then we would also hold these monthly meetings. Uh, with everyone in the room, right? Because everyone's voice was really important at this time, and it's always still important, and transparency is really important. It's just that as you grow and develop, you can't always get everybody in a room before you decide really basic things, right? So we, we valued direct involvement in decision-making, but we also, um, as they talked about, didn't always do it in person. We, we innovated, we used Facebook to help us with, with decision making. And by the second year though, we had developed rapport and trust through sharing uh, responsibilities. And so in order to uh, get comfortable with that uncertainty I talked about, one of, some of the things that we had to do was shed some old ways we had to let go of overstructuring and hierarchy. We completely, we have no committees, for example. We work on 
a basic basis of teams, and no team is sacred. That's important. If, if a team isn't going somewhere, it, we just dissolve it. If there's no energy around it, it goes. We don't have a membership team, for example. Just let you sit, let that sit there for a minute. Because <laughs> so, there's no need. We don't, we've decided not to police any of those boundaries. We're a community. If you say you're a part of it, you're a part of it. We also let go of programming. There was no special team assigned to making the show happen every week that we so often feel like we have to in our traditional congregations. Instead, as we got together, we used open space technology. Uh, technology is a strong word. Basically, what it meant was a Google Doc during the week with a big grid of all the possible spaces you could do something in, depending on where we were that week. It might be rooms, it might be areas of the park, and then the time slots down the side. And people could fill in, they could volunteer. If someone volunteered to lead worship, we had a worship service. If they didn't, we didn't. There was no group of experts sitting there waiting to respond to the needs of the community. It was all organic. And it developed a deep bench, let me tell you, pretty quick. I'd say over half of our group at this point has led worship, including our nine and 10 year olds. We've had a uh, whole entire weeks where we've gotten together just to share food and break bread. We've had weeks where we don't meet in a church or any kind of church, we meet with our neighbors, we uh, cultivate the garden, and it has been transforming to let go of the need to feel like we should respond to the consumer-oriented nature of church today. We just don't do that. And then finally, we had to let go of our sense of urgency around changing any of this anytime soon. Whether we, we let go of the sense of urgency around the need to grow numerically and financially to build the pot of money which was really good because we didn't even have a bank account until last November. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> so. All right, so what we gained when we let go of those things is we new leadership stepped up. Existing leadership avoided the burnout associated with the grind of keeping the programs going the planning going. A note about our planning. We ended up having a few people who were very familiar with uh, improv and taught us and actually led improv services and uh, workshops and taught us this valuable lesson of saying yes and. If you're familiar with improv, what that means is with, when you're, with your improv partner, you want to make sure that you never make your partner look bad. So if your partner gives you the gift of saying, wow, what's that flower pot on the top of your head? You run with it, right? Now apply that to a faith community. You, you don't always know what's gonna come at you, but you run with it. And if a proposal comes, if somebody's got a great idea, let's try it. We develop the yes and. What that also resulted in was a high percentage of engagement and deep commitment levels across the age span because people's ideas were actually listened to and followed through. We had the youth one time lead us in a, work, in a worship service where they had us all, I kid you not, we actually did this, um, they, they told a story about fairies. They wrote this themselves. And the fairies would get out in the middle of the night and paint the room various colors from like their bellies or their arms. And so sh they had us moving around the room and literally like wallowing on the ground on our bellies. We said yes and. <laughs> it's really interesting to see your elders doing that. But you know what, the kids loved it. Because they were being included, listened to, heard, and followed. Okay. Now, when you let go of those things, you also can lose people who respond to all of that uncertainty with fear and anxiety. So we did have to also say goodbye to people who just couldn't live in that uncertainty for that prolonged period of time. All right. So 
the guiding principles that emerged was we had plan as far as our headlights could see. So you can think of the metaphor of driving on a winding road at night with all the hairpin turns. We planned as far as our headlights could see. We feed what has energy. If a team is no longer functioning, has no longer no energy, you let it go. You don't fundraise for this, that, or the other thing unless there's energy. We still don't have an official budget. We don't work on a budget. We work on projects and raise around that. Step up, step back. That's probably been the keystone element of all of this. Having leadership step back so that there's room for new leadership to step up. We don't all have to be controlling everything. We can let it go, let other people step in, and it is surprisingly effective. And then finally, because if you're saying yes and, you're going to have failure. And we learn to embrace failure as a feature, not a bug, of our faith community. So thank you. So um, uh, her story was about a new start, an emerging congregation. And I'm going to just tell a little bit shorter story about a congregation, an existing congregation, that, um, that sort of found, found humility in, and that helped them to move forward from some significant challenges they were having. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the Community Church of New York. Is there anybody here from community in the room? OK. Good, I can say anything I want. <laughs> No, uh, I actually have the permission of the minister and the board president to, to share their stories. Way back when I uh, first met the wonderful leadership at the Community Church of New York in New York City, which is uh, at the corner of 35th and Park in a, a very, um, you know, sort of a historic area, historic building, um, they were in significant conflict. They, um, they had... Um, uh, long, long board meetings. Their board was really functioning uh, more as a management board. Uh, they have significant rental properties and most of their rather large budget is, comes from the rental of, of these uh, properties that they have in New York City, which you can imagine are, is, is a pretty significant amount. So there was a lot of anxiety around money. Does anybody have that in their congregation? Yeah. Oh, that happens in congregations, doesn't it? So a lot of anxiety around money, and some of those anxieties uh, really manifested as that lack of trust in leaders, lack of trust in elected leaders, lack of trust also in uh, the minister and the professional staff. Um, they had board meetings that used to go till 11 o'clock at night, and they had conflict that um, would, would result in, you know, some shoe banging on the table kind of conflict. I know you, none of you have ever had, you know, nobody's ever raised their voice at a board meeting, right? Uh, and, and the board and the minister were really out of covenant in that congregation. Uh, and the rest of the congregation was um, blissfully um, just letting them work it out because it's their issue, right? This is the way our congregations work sometimes. So they actually hit bottom after they, a group gathered together, the parking lot group, except in New York City, you don't have parking lots, the sidewalk, the, the Starbucks up on, on the corner, Madison and 35th, they um, decided that they wanted, that, th that the problem was the minister. So the minister's gotta go. So a group gathered and it, it all came to a head at an annual meeting where a vote was taken. And um, the congregation voted to, uh, to stay in relationship with the minister. It wasn't uh, a unanimous vote by any means. It wasn't a vote um, that, um, you know, maybe some, someone else would have said, hmm, maybe it's time for me to move on. But, but this minister was committed to continuing to work with the congregation. And at that moment, the board and the leadership of the congregation said, you know, we, we, the only way to change is to change. And we're the ones that have to do some of that work. 
So they committed themselves to um, a lot of training. Uh, they did uh, team leadership training. They, they went to a residential school called ULTI, UU Leadership Team Institute. And Renee's going to tell you about uh, the, the granddaughter or the daughter of, of ULTI in her presentation. Uh, and they sent teams for several years. And these were not always happy moments, okay? So they came to Leadership Institute and they learned about things like governance. They learned about things like healthy communication. And this actually set off a few more sparks, and there, it created more friction. But they continued to stay in relationship. They continued to work on learning together. They continued to um, try to build trust within the congregation. They committed themselves to healthy leadership practices. Has anybody ever heard of healthy congregations? Do they have that in your, in your neck of the woods? In the Central East region, we've had a long commitment to healthy congregations training, and uh, many, many of our congregations have, have done that. And, and so they did that with several generations of leaders, not, not just that first generation that was in conflict, but they continued it. Every leader that came along would continue to be trained. They would learn healthy ways of, of dealing with conflict, healthy ways of communicating with one another, how to keep their own anxiety in check, and, they, and how to also be more self-aware and di self-differentiated as individuals. So they worked a little bit on their own spiritual maturity. They had a number of facilitated board retreats. Staff came in and supported them in some of this work when it really became clear that they um, really couldn't do this on their own. And that happens with congregations. Sometimes we reach, a, we reach a moment where we can't do the work on our own and we need to reach out. And um, we hope that um, in, your, in your area, wherever you are, that you have either district staff or regional staff or a cluster where you can reach out to leaders in other congregations to help you to come and facilitate and help you have healthier conversations. So they're in great shape. I just did a board retreat with them uh, within the last month or two. Um, they have work to do. They have a long way to go. Uh, we all are making it up as we go. We're all living organic organizations, but they have come a long way. And, uh, you know, this was a group that their meetings have gotten way shorter. Uh, they have some really um, good conversations as leaders. They're able to be reflective with one another. They have an increased sort of self-awareness about uh, their work as leaders, what they bring, and how they communicate, the covenant that they have with one another. They have grown their sense of a mission, uh, both as a board and as a congregation. And again, they have lots of work still to do. Uh, we're all works in progress. They, they have reached some common understandings uh, between the staff, the ministry, and the lay leadership that have helped them. They've, they've kind of level that understanding of who we are and, and why we're here and what's my role versus your role. And they've renewed their sense of call to being a spiritual community, to being a faith community. So I'm real proud of them. And I just want to just close with this metaphor, because I love this metaphor, and I, I do think this is one of the pieces of the work that Community Church did. And that's this idea of the dolphin versus the whale. And so dolphins, you know, uh, if you're, I don't know, ever, anybody, you know, go to the beach and see the, the, the dolphins, you know, the Jersey Shore. I'm a Jer Jersey Shore girl. Um, so dolphins, they travel in groups. Right? They travel in pods, they stay together, and they come up and down, they take short breaths, and there's, there's this constant sort of communication, and when they come up for breath, they're looking for the others in their pod. They, don't, they, they know that they are in a group and they want to check in with that group on a regular basis. Whales are, somehow we think of whales and dolphins as kind of having this similar thing, you know, they come up for air and then they go down. Whales go down much deeper. They take a much longer breath. They don't come up and check around for others in their community in the same way. And the world changes around them while they're under the water. 
So um, it's just an interesting metaphor for you to take away and think about. You should be, you should be like dolphins. You've got you to gotta take a short breath. You've got you to gotta dig into the work, but you have to keep coming up for air and checking in with the community around you. So Pat had mentioned our, our leadership school, ALTI. Um, the, some of the core ideas of ALTI is that we want people to learn in teams from congregations. So it was originally set up where you would have to send a team that included both lay leaders and professional leaders. And they would come and spend a week together and they'd you know, go really deeply in all these different ideas and learn from one another. And then they'd take the ideas that they learned and take them back to their congregations. And it worked great for the congregations who could afford to send leaders and who had leaders who could afford to take a week off of work or whatever in order to spend this time together. And it worked really well for some of those congregations. Unfortunately, um, that's becoming harder and harder to do. And so, um, and also just expensive, crazy expensive, right? Most of the cost goes to the, uh, the retreat centers. You know, the room and board is where most of the money goes. It's not so much about the instruction itself. So um, a couple of years ago, we were trying to rethink how we might do leadership school. And we came up with a, a hybrid online version of ULTI, which we recently rebranded into this Leadership Institute. And we, what we wanted to do is really keep this idea of teams learning together. And you'll see that in the, inside the little um, cell phone graphic there. How can we make an opportunity for teams to learn together in order to have this opportunity of minister and religious educator and membership um, coordinator and all these different staff people along with their lay leaders to learn together, um, creating a, a, a container where that could happen. So this is kind of part of the ethos of what this style of leadership school is trying to help you do. Um, again, it's, you know, it's a flipped classroom model, and if you, there's a website you can check in. I'm not here to talk about this specifically, but there are information cards um, at the Congregational Life booth, and I also will have business cards that'll have the website on it if you want to come up and get one. But the idea is, um, instead of going away for a week and spending all this money, you go online to get the coursework, and we do offer Healthy Congregations as our core kind of flagship course, but there's lots of other courses you can take. And then you meet together with your team in your congregation, but also with teams from other congregations in your cluster. So you're not only learning from one another in your congregation, you're learning from the congregation down the street and building those covenantal relationships so that covenant can be a verb as well as a noun in your, in your community. And so, um, the other piece about this is that the in-person sessions are facilitated by peers, what we call peer hosts. So we are, us, you know, part of the regionalization piece is how can we leverage your UUA staff like Pat and I, um, you know, we have some, some expertise and, you know, we teach and things like that. But coming in person is the best part, right? To actually get to talk with one another, engage with the topics like you're gonna get to do in a little bit here. And so what we decided to do is actually train people to host the in-person sessions by cluster. And so um, this is sort of the story about how Lori and I met. Um, Lori called me up. She knew that I did healthy congregations. And I do a lot of webinars and stuff um, on YouTube. Google my name and you'll get a lot of videos. And so Lori called up and said, wow, we have this congregational start. And um, we're in, I'll tell a little story of the cluster. Um, we're in this cluster where I think there were two congregations and both of those congregations had conflicts and split into two more congregations. And one of those congregations split, and there was another congregation. And so there's DNA in the Indianapolis cluster of conflict and splitting and conflict and splitting. And so for those of you who've had systems understanding, that's going to show up unless you're really intentional about inoculating your congregation against it. So she and her leaders realized they wanted to inoculate sacred path from that pattern in their congregational cluster. 
And so she became a peer host and she recruited some other folks from the other congregations in the cluster and um, they became peer hosts and they have been my flagship cluster, I tell you. It's part of it is they were self-motivated. They, you know, recruited people. They ran t uh, a fall semester and a spring semester of, of courses or of, of um, in-person sessions. And some of their learnings were, they were able to kind of um, debrief some of these conflicts. It's like, wow, this happened and this happened and this is a classic case of triangulation and this happened and this happened and this is homeostasis. So they were really able to um, not only work the case studies that we gave them, but to also bring their own case studies from their own congregations and realize the patterns that had been showing up over and over again. And they're able to um, heal some of the conflicts that had happened and heal relationships and they're able to work together in a way that they haven't been able to work together before. So it's just this amazing um, system of, of, or like this vision of how we hoped it would work and then Indianapolis just took it and ran with it. And so part of this is we use the, the cons, uh, like the theological concept of process theology. It's the creative interchange. When we're with one another with open hearts and open minds and let ourselves be vulnerable with one another and we're, we have this shared vision of um, what kind of religious community we want to create, if we're able to create that container, um, the, the, if, if I, using theist language, the Holy Spirit shows up. The magic happens in the room. It's that stuff that happens, that we, why we love to come to GA and have these conversations. So we're tr intentionally trying to create the kind of culture where that kind of experience happens. And then there's also opportunities to integrate what you learn online. So webinars are kind of cool, but you don't really, if you don't have a chance to really engage with it with someone else, you don't really retain it as well and you don't embody it. So the idea is to you know, create that learning experience. Um, the other thing is that the way the, the Saturdays are set up is that everybody has a piece of expertise that they bring into the system. So um, the way it should, youth are able to, if youth participate, they have expertise that they bring to the table. And so it creates a natural learning community because everyone is learning something from everybody else. So the idea is this is helping to create that habit of humility by just using this structure and format. And so I've been very, very intentional about this learning community ethos. And one of the first things I do is I ask every single participant to agree to a covenant of participation which is really, um, this, is, this is on the website, to have that beginner's mind, to know that all of us have expertise, influence, um, and uh, different worldviews, that we want to hold each other accountable to keeping this community the way it is, and to make space for everyone's contribution. So to really, I mean, these are things that we really you know, talk about in our covenants, but it's very clear that um, this, we need to have this happening in the room for, to make the magic happen of our creative interchange. And so that's it. Okay, so good. So um, we're gonna give you a chance to think about your own context. So what you might want to do in your own community to create a learning community or, or to, we can always be better at being a learning community. So if you already have this ethos in your congregation, there's always ways of doing it better. So what we've done is we have some index cards. We have three different colors which totally do not look like, well, actually it's not too bad. We have, oh how interesting, they actually show up correctly up there. We have green cards, no we have red cards, I'm sorry, red cards, blue cards, and yellow cards. So. The stop doing is the red, that's kind of easy to remember. Um, the blue cards are, so what do you want to stop doing in order to create a learning community? You know, getting rid of the viruses might be one thing. Um, what do you want to start doing differently in your congregation to help create this learning community culture of humility? And what are you doing well already that you want to keep doing? You want to make sure you don't lose that. So that would be the yellow card. So we're gonna um, pass these out, and we want you to get together in groups of three, maybe four, and just have that conversation about what's going on with your congregation and how you can take what we've talked about back home with you.